Sandra. Uh, just a quick question to the audience. Uh, I'd just like to see a show of hands how many here have uh, children that they don't regard as adults yet. Okay, so there's quite I've a few. got grandchildren I don't regard as adults. Very good. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I might open for questions in a minute. I just wanted to share a couple of anecdotes just that came to mind after I listened to Cassandra. Um, my daughter, she's nearly eight, uh, and just to paint a picture of my daughter, my daughter, she likes to climb trees, and we're privileged to have a big yard with some trees. Um, and she will grab her pink handbag, she will shove her Barbie doll in there, she'll whack her pirate eye cap on, and she'll climb up the tree and her feet will be somewhere up here where the lights are. And at that point I usually gasp and look away. Um, but I've always felt very strongly that she needs to make decisions and she needs to figure these things out for herself. Um, consequences happened recently, she broke her arm, um, which gave me a little bit of pause. But the way she handled that whole experience kind of said to me that actually something's going right here. And another quick anecdote, my son um, is nearly 13. He went away on a hike recently for three days. They caught the train to Woi Woi uh, with packs on the back, went hiking out in the wilderness for three days. Part of the scouting movement, which is a, a civil society organisation that I highly commend to anyone that's got parents. Uh, it's all about teaching people self-reliance and uh, <laughs> 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 have children. <laughs> uh, and so I asked him, I said, who's leading this and how old are they? And uh, he said, oh, it's this girl, Lucy, she's 14. And I said, okay, fair enough. But off they went for three days and yeah. they were fine. And it was, uh, you know, kids can still do those sorts of things today, but I agree. It's actually that the institutional or the social environment we, we're in, cultural environment, has made it harder. But uh, parents should still, I think, be making opportunities for the kids. I'll throw open to questions um, and I'll allow the panel to ask each other questions if they wish as well. So, Peter. All these things like pool fences and, uh, and trampolines and all this sort of stuff, um, does this come out of the courts who've, who've made big um, payments to, to um, people in certain situations? <coughs> so I, I, would, so I always try to say there's two exceptions to the don't worry about anything, it's all garbage rule. One is seat belts and the other is pool fences. Pool fences are fantastic. Um, the, I'll give you an example of how silly most of the rest of it is. When you look at the children's safety advice about backyards, they'll tell you how many kids every year die in backyards. What they don't tell you is that once you control for swimming pools, the number's basically zero. Yeah, but, but the, que the question was about what extent is, yeah. does this come back to the court? So it's actually, I, I think having paid attention to this for a while now, there is a, one of, it would be nice if there were a couple of culprits whose actions could be addressed and misinformation could be corrected. But there is a conspiracy of goodwill. There are far too many people who really think that they're doing the right thing. And get, I get quite upset people telling me that you know it's so irresponsible that you would tell people to be less safe. Um, and it's, I think, it, it is you know <coughs> the road that is paved with good intentions is the, is the problem here. And that's why addressing it requires us to. You, know, you can't just solve one problem. There's, there are parent groups, there are professional academics who study safety, you know, you're all familiar with the growth in preventative health and safety. And then there's the Australian standards process, um, you know, which keeps creeping the safety standards for everything up and up and up. Um, then there's the politicians who go looking for things like junk food in canteens because they need an issue to run on. So it's, it's everywhere. And I think a lot of people are sincere in their level of care. Um, and that's what makes it really hard. Is, is, you know, sometimes you can see people just being cravenly self-serving about a particular product or interest or project they've got. When it comes to kids' safety, there is so much genuinely sincere concern. It's really misplaced. But that's why I think you have to attack it with some compassion for where it's coming from, not just make fun of it, although making fun of it's quite fun. <laughs> I've had something like eight children in my life, of which four have been biologically mine. Um, and my comment would be it's horses for courses. I mean, every child is different. And what suits one doesn't suit the other. And there needs to be some kind of internal politics in the family where the trade-offs are, are, are made. But my real question is about the role of the state where the parents themselves are defective in some obvious manner. 
and uh, and the role of the state, in fact, in breaking families up or encouraging families to break up, uh, because my observation in schools is that there's a large number of children there that come from single parent families or families where they don't know who their parents fully are, um, and so on. Does the state have any role in all of this? Do you want to have a crack? <laughs> this is really tricky, um, because it's you know, you see these horrible cases where children are being, you know, systematically abused and, I mean, the regulation... I mean minor abuse. So I'm not talking minor... about, you know, major oh, abuse. This is They're neglected in some manner. They're not fed properly. Well, I mean, They're not vaccinated, say. Depend, you know. But this, I mean, that's all subjective, you know. Like, um, what one parent's, you know... I think some people would look at my parenting and say, you know, she's brazenly negligent. I sent my seven-year-old to get the milk the other day from down the road, and that would be, yeah, <laughs> brazenly negligent. So, I mean, this is such a subjective question. It's a really hard thing. I mean, you can't, you know, you want to protect minors from bad parenting, but any regulation you put in place is sort of a bit redundant because if you're going to be a bad parent, you don't care about, you're not, most of the case, you're not going to care about the law regardless. You know, it's... Is the milk had... still in the cow, or is it... <laughs> yeah, hand milked. Yeah. <laughs> With the cream. Yeah. It's, it's, it is very tricky though. It's, um... Yeah, I'll answer that as well. I'm a libertarian, so um, I don't think there's any role for the state. But I see um, a group only has rights that individuals within the group already had and could assign to the group. So the question to me is, what is... If a child's being abused, do I have a, a right to go and rescue the child? Uh, and I would say, if a child's being aggressed against, if it's being um, abused, um, in a serious sense, then then the child, as a self-owner, has a has a, a right to leave that ha that household. But as a very young child that can't exercise that right, then the rest of us do have some sort of right, although it can't be clearly defined at a particular age or a particular instance. It's, an open, it's, you know, it's a grey area that maybe courts have to decide in specific cases. But even before the court decided, if I saw a child being sexually assaulted, say, I would go and take that step and I'd rescue that child. And I'd take that child into my own house and I'd let someone take me to court later on if they wanted to. And then I would argue that I was doing the right thing. But I would say, you have to decide, are you willing to go and rescue that child yourself? And if you see one child over here being sexually assaulted, and another child over there being fed raw milk, so which one are you going to go and rescue? Because you can't go and rescue everybody. You can't go and say, you can't say, everybody has a right to the best parents in the world. Right? Because those best parents in the world would be very busy, wouldn't they? <laughs> so we all have to put up with not quite the best parents, you know? We have to put up with ordinary human being parents, but yet we have to rescue those who are being most seriously abused. So that's where we should concentrate. Uh, Ditto? Uh, I agree with you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, so just to sort of expand on that point, uh, vaccinations. Uh, is it responsible parenting or an Illuminati conspiracy? Only options. At the risk of revisiting a very long, crazy thread some while back, I'm in the camp that says kids are people with rights, cell phones, as you say. Um, and I think that the vaccination argument um, has been framed in terms of parents' rights, which is a nonsense, and that kids need to be vaccinated. There are simple things that are essential to their well-being, then the child citizen has a right to those things being done for them while they're little. Any different views? Uh, I, I'd just say that the, the vaccination is not an all or nothing choice. If I was taking my children to a very poor village in India, I would probably opt for a few more vaccines uh, than I would um, living in Sydney. That there's not just a certain bucket of these 28 things must be taken, uh, you know, and only 27 out of the 28 of them would be child abuse. It is a bit silly, you know. 
you, you make a cost-benefit decision uh, you, and you make a marginal decision, like you do with everything. I am. Um, I've vaccinated all my kids late. Um, the first one, hepatitis B, you get, you're in the hospital. It's, I don't want to get into the discussion, but there's a lot of first world countries like Japan where they don't vaccinate till two. There's a lot of different literature on when is the correct rate, rate to vaccinate, what, you know, what to do it against. And um, I mean, obviously when we went into the developing countries, all the vaccinations are up to date. But I mean, when I had my newborn in my arm, um, the first one I gave the hepatitis B vaccine too, no problems. Even though this is a bloodborne, you know, disease, and really, my sister who worked in drug and alcohol said we used to give this to all the mums who were prostitutes who were delivering babies because we were a bit worried, frankly, that this was going to be an issue. So when it came to that vaccine, I said I think hepatitis B is a, it, you know, it's, everyone should be entitled to the hepatitis B vaccine. Giving it to my newborn baby, you know, and the first one had a fever overnight, you know, it was a bit traumatic. Well, there isn't much of a point. So it's, it's something once again, you know, it's you can't take an axe to it. It needs a bit of Mark said a bit of finesse. Trish? Yeah, um, so when I grew up, I had this nice suburban house in Norman. I used to run around with my friends and stuff. But then when we moved to Sydney, we moved into an apartment building. And then part of that was because I didn't know any of the other kids around. My parents didn't know their parents. Um, in terms of the environment, it was a lot less hospitable. I, I, mean, I would think that while a bit with cats, you live in an apartment, yet your kids are quite active. I mean, I'm just wondering where, how we kind of reconcile this, this general move amongst, like, you know, a lot of people tr wanting to live in, like, higher density living, yeah. particularly in the inner city, with also trying to give your kids some freedom. It's a huge, it's a massive problem, but I, I we, our last house before, we live in a flat around the corner. Our last house, you could jump off our back fence into a river and swim to the national park. Uh, that, still, I miss that house. That that is the kids, the best place in the world to raise kids. Except that we were spending two hours every day in traffic. So the experience my kids have on the weekend of swimming, walking, hanging out, jumping off rocks happened on weekends. <coughs> their experience on the weekday was doing their homework in the backseat car. So for us, moving to the city has meant that I work till 4.30 or 5, they finish school at 3.30 or 4, which means they can either walk up to the shops, hang out with their friends, they can go to after school clubs, or they can get the bus home by themselves. They have afternoons to themselves now. It's the first time in their lives where they've had regular, completely unsupervised time. So for us, moving to the city has been very freeing for our family because the commute had distorted what used to be the case, which was kind of, you know, bucolic suburbs versus the kind of densely crowded city. Our experience has been quite chunky and yeah. Well, we're in the inner city as well. We have an apartment too, and um, and we don't have a backyard. And I think it's actually a bit of a blessing not having a backyard because our backyard is the neighbourhood park. Maybe, you know, we're in um. Surrey Hills, there's so many parks around, the kids, yeah, there's a hundred kids there at the parks, you know, across the afternoon, you know, and they, they it's wonderful actually. It's a really do you let them ride a kids. bike on, on the street? I do. <laughs> well, we've got bike paths, so thanks Clover. <laughs> but on the street, and then like Parramatta Road, and Glee Point Road, and places you know, like that. If my kids ever got to a point where they wanted to ride a bike down Parramatta Road, I'd, I'd take a look at, careful look at them and say if you felt that that was what you needed, but I don't think there'd be any chance mm -hmm. they'd want to. Just a quick comment. I, we raised three kids uh, in Amsterdam uh, for a couple of years and, uh, and uh, unfenced canals everywhere. You know, just... you know the, the pool deaths we talk about, um, you never have children drowning in a home pool. That's at your own home without fences even. They never die. They, it's always when you go to someone else's house and you're unsure. No, that's, I mean, that's what the statistics, the, statistics, the experts say. That they, I mean, since the campaign... We have to see it. Out, <laughs> since the campaign started saying kids are drowning in pools, watch out. The number of pool deaths, like, dropped dramatically. Then we discussed fencing, right? It's... But well, you don't die in your own The deaths from drowning for kids is about 300 a year. It's been about 300 year, a year for about five years. It's actually it's one of the only causes of death injury that's not coming down. But, but this is like if you compare that to 20 years ago when you know it was at its peak, 
you know, and, and that just goes to show that the fences have been more or less ineffective. Like you count on the fences, that's when the drownings happen. When you say, I mean, the latest one was, you know, they said, oh, the fence wasn't working. I mean, that's what everyone, all the drownings tend to be, right? Do your own research, look it up yourself, no point mm. arguing over Good things point. where there are facts to be had. I might just put a question to the panel myself. Um, most law at the moment defines a person as being an adult when they become 18. Do you think the law has got it right? Um, should there be modifiers to that? What, what's your general opinion? Is 18 the right number? You're a 14-year-old. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, unless they're having sex, in which case it's different. I, I think that's just, just as arbitrary and stupid as 99.9% .9 of other laws. Um, uh, uh, do we need an arbitrary and stupid law? Do we need one? Uh, I don't try to make decisions for other people. At my house, while the kids are in, in my house under my care, they go by my rules, but they're free to leave at any age. They're free to walk out the door as soon as they have the mental capacity to say, I don't want you to be my parents anymore. I'm going to go and seek other parents. <laughs> they're free to leave right, at any age um, because they own themselves. I don't own them. Um, but they haven't chosen that. <laughs> they, they like living at my house. And until they do, we're going to make the most of it. Well, uh, they know, might say that until they're 50. The rules might start to change. <laughs> 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 Any other comments from the panel? Yes. Oh, no, I just, I just think that, that we often frame these things the wrong way around. I mean, children, I always go back to the old I didn't ask to be born principle, right? You are not doing them a favour by making them breakfast and sending them to school and not smacking them or whatever it is you do to raise your kids. You know, we invited them into our lives. We decided to have kids. We welcomed them. My kids are honoured, blessed guests in my home. And I hope they stay all through university and, uh, you know, <laughs> have their grandchildren that, that's in you. my that's, house. That's you, that's you and your kids, but from a public policy perspective. I just mean that people are often saying, you know, um, Framing these things in a way that says, well, you know, not to start a fight, but the my house, my rules thing. No, it's, it's our house. I invited them in. I asked them to come. No, in my son's case, I asked, I asked, I asked. It took a long time. To find it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's our house and our rules. We do it together, and we don't really have very many rules. We mostly just get along with each other and, you know, try to work things out as they come up. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh, yeah, it's a better way to say it. Oh. <laughs> um, Listen, it's, um, it's really a tough one because, I mean, there's some things like voting, I don't know, when, when do you decide, you know, I, I, I tend to think that once a child stands up and says that they want to do it, like my Mark said, you know, that um, they should be given the right to do it. I, I think it's just having an age is just a... When they start paying tax, that's when it should Well, there you go. I heard that one. I think. Go and make a comment. Yeah. 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 over here. <laughs> I, I like you, you mentioned three words, but I, I call them the three R's. Um, rights, rules, and responsibilities. So where is the division, in your opinion, as parents? Because as a libertarian, I raised a son as a single parent and had my rights, rules, and responsibilities in a country town. What do you see as the division between you as the adult in the family who has invited the children, or however you wish to call it, your rights, rules, and responsibilities compared to the rights, rules, and responsibilities of each of the children. For three R's. The basically it's the same. I mean, you know, if there's a if there's an idealistic communist utopia that socialists never really had a chance to implement, that's the kind of way my house works. It's each according to their ability. You know, you contribute according to your ability and you take according to your need. And I'm not suggesting that as a system of government for a whole society. <laughs> Just in my house, that's basically how we work things out. People want to do things. You know, we've all got competing preferences. And, um, you know, we just work it out as if we'd all like to get on. Exactly. <laughs> that's libertopia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't agree with that too. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I was someone that was born in 1991 and has grown up in, well, The Simpsons, I think, started the same year. And unfortunately, Helen Lovejoy has been a, a continuing satire throughout my entire life. And it's been a rallying cry for nanny, nanny statists. But uh, the other question, just on the vaccine topic, when you 
when parents potentially or children of themselves not vaccinated, does that take away the rights of pe people with autoimmune diseases to have herd immunity to these diseases and is it potentially infringing? Yeah, I suspect we're going to go to against one on this one as well. I'm, I'm with you on the herd immunity requires everybody chips in front with vaccinations, but I do acknowledge that it's it's conceptually and philosophically it's, it's, it's a tough argument even by smart people around good principles. Uh, I think the question is not really relevant to this session. It's a, it's another topic, oh and we've got two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might go we might go a little over time given we started, but if, we, if we're all coming, so we've got three minutes. So we've got three minutes. <laughs> Um, I don't know, like, um, that's a tough one um, if you talk about herd immunity. If, um, if I have a disease which um, means that inhaling hair makes me very, very ill, is it the responsibility of society to cut, everyone cut their hair? Is, yes. that, is that a fair... <laughs> is that a fair... Is that a fair... Like, you know, I mean, I think, I think we should all try and work together in a society, but I think compelling people to vaccinate their children is... It's like no smoking rules, you know. Some people have asthma. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, question yeah. here and then here, and then I think that'll be it. I have a question for uh, Ali. Do the people in Cambodia, do they have the concept of a teenager, or do they just simply grow up and marry and go on with it? Yeah, you know, I can't. Um, no, they don't. There's no, there's, these kids are just, I mean, you have to see them to believe these, these children, you know, Toddling around, no, there doesn't seem yeah. to be a great concept of a teenager. Like how hard you can yeah. work. It know? seems to be to, to me that uh, something the Western civilization basically has in the, for the couple of last few hundred years. And, and related, related to that, um, how old do the girls marry then? They do tend to. It's getting older actually. Like every every year as they come out of you know the old regime, it is getting older every year, isn't it, John? Early twenties would be the norm. It used to be late teens, and Bhopal's twenty nine and she's not married. And they consider her weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, her parents I, are really annoyed. <laughs> I had a brother in law. Oh, I have a brother in law. He did a lot of travelling in rural China, and I remember him saying that he would frequently encounter a three-year-old struggling with something like a kerosene lamp and trying to light the thing and he was horrified he said you wouldn't see that in Australia but he said that sort of scene was actually quite normal and uh, very different to hear. The kids Sorry. are very savvy, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering what your opinion is of fluoridation of the water system. <laughs> 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 because a lot of people in the country are against it, they say, you know, it's infringing on the children's rights and effects of bad news children. I'd really love to rip off my mask and show my lips in heaven. Fluoridation <laughs> 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 for everyone. Yeah, no, look, I just, I just fucking, um, look, I have no fillings. I, I, yeah. I brush only as regularly as other people. I'm pretty sure it has to be the fluoride. I don't know. It seems to me that sanitation, pretty good. Fluoride, pretty good. Clean air, get the lead out of the petrol. <laughs> These things. We don't have to waste all of our intellectual curiosity and, and our goodwill in argument really fighting over fluoride when we have, you know, the ASIO powers, the abolition of the right to silence. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are some pretty big yeah. things that we need to fix in the country and I think if we rip each other's heads off about vaccination and fluoride, we're going to waste our energy. Rachel had a thing you did post about the free market um, in water in Chile or Brazil or somewhere, didn't you? Like, we just need a free market for water, so you can either tick, you know, renewable water sources, I'll take two parts fluoride, that's, you know. <laughs> We're on um, tank water at my place, but we don't go putting extra fluoride tablets in the tank. How are your children's uh, tea? And, and I don't know anybody how are you, who does. How are your children's tea? Oh, uh, so, um, so, people yeah. that this debate is about what should I make other people do, not about what should I do myself. Really. That's the point. But you have to do that for your children. That's the point. There's no escaping it. When you've got right. a baby, you either breastfeed no. the baby or you don't. Uh, but we don't the put baby doesn't have a choice. In their water. We don't put um, protein in their water. We uh, provide these needs through other means other than by putting secret tablets in the water. But I agree with um, Cass that, it, that, that it's, it's one of the most minor and pointless things to, to debate about. Do you want whiskey in the water? Just as a contrast, I grew up on rainwater, 
uh, and I have loads of fillings. Yeah. Um, but that said, that said, I know someone who works in the water industry, and she says she hasn't brushed her teeth for years because of fluoride. She said the issue is more about acidity. The science, I really got no clue on. Um, but uh, I think we'll kind of wrap it up here because John's giving me the stare. Uh, so, uh, could everyone please thank our panel? Like Thank you all everyone, just before you run off, so we have about 50 minutes for lunch, we're not putting on a lunch now, so if, you, uh, if, if you're a local you'll know where you can get a bite to eat, if you're not a local, go 